Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Private Bankers Find Greater Independence, former $2 billion JP Morgan team on their new chapter with Crescent. It's a conversation with Kevin McGuire and Sarah Burney, Managing Directors and Wealth Advisors at Crescent. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who are considering change or simply looking to learn more about the industry landscape, please feel free to share this episode or the series widely. Historically, it was rare to find a private banker that left not only their private bank, but the model itself partly because they were really tied into the bank and partly because while they got a steady stream of referrals and a great way to build a business, should those private bankers look to make a change, they were often met with challenges, including asset portability concerns, difficulties with replicating the business, added legal risks, and the most onerous hurdle of all, garden leave provisions. Yet over the past year, we've seen many of these folks leave their banks they built their businesses at, many planting new flags at Merrill, UBS, and Morgan Stanley, firms that recently expressed a new level of interest in welcoming private bankers, while others have opted to build their own independent businesses. Yet a third group has found homes in the new generation of family offices, multifamily offices, that is, opting for an environment that caters to ultra and high net worth clients with concierge level services and a more entrepreneurial environment. One might say, providing what many find attractive about the independent space without the need to build it from scratch. But even more importantly, a platform, boutique culture, and level of support that allows advisors to do what they do best, focus on their clients and growing their business. So in this episode, we welcome two private bankers who fit into this latter category, Kevin McGuire and Sarah Burney, both hailed from J.P. Morgan Private Bank, having built a strong business overseeing some $2 billion with ultra-high net worth individuals and families. With over a dozen years each under their belt, they and their team started to feel conflict between what they wanted to do for their clients and what they could do under the auspices of J.P. Morgan. And ultimately, they wanted greater control over how they manage client relationships. So they explored all their options and even the possibility of taking a more entrepreneurial path of starting their own RIA. But ultimately, they landed on Crescent, an employee and client-owned multifamily office born in 2017, designed to deliver a new paradigm for wealth management with rock star leadership and advisor talent. In fact, in an episode from our 2021 season, I had the privilege of speaking with Crescent co-founder Avi Stein on this show. At that time, Crescent was a $12 billion firm, and they've exploded since, more than doubling to $27 billion in assets under management as of this recording. It's growth like that which makes it clear that Crescent's value proposition is resonating with the wealth management world, particularly Sarah, Kevin, and three other members of their team at J.P. Morgan, who joined in September of 2021. In this episode, Sarah and Kevin discuss life as private bankers, the limiting nature of the private banker salary bonus model, the challenges of transitioning, including portability and garden leave provisions, the attraction of the Crescent model, and why it won out over others. Life with the firm nearly a year later, and much more. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get to it. Kevin, 
Kevin and Sarah, I am so grateful for you making the time today and sharing your story with us. Thank you for being here. Happy to be here. Thanks for the time, Mindy. Thanks for having us. You bet. Well, let's start at the beginning. So would love for each of you to take a minute or so and tell us about yourselves and your professional journey to joining Crescent Capital. Sure thing. So I've spent my entire career in financial services. I began my career in New York working for Morgan Stanley and the chief investment officer of their private banking business. I spent the last 12 years in Denver in private banking at J.P. Morgan. Most of my career has been in the private bank. However, early on, I spent a couple of years in the investment bank, and that was the moment where I really determined that I had the most professional satisfaction and having the opportunity to work with families and wealth creators and really helping them solve problems. Uh, Working at J.P. Morgan at the onset of my career, we were small. It was very boutique feeling. We covered a select number of clients, but over the course of that 14 years, There was certainly a lot of growth in the business, which a lot of good comes out of that, but also some challenges arose as as J.P. Morgan's private bank business grew. So seemingly you had less control and and less choice over how to work with families and clients. And that kind of started my curiosity about what it would be like to be a little bit more entrepreneurial, work at a smaller shop, and really have the opportunity to serve clients and meet clients where they are in their wealth creation journey. So A couple of years ago, my four partners, myself, including Kevin, started to turn an eye towards looking towards the independent path. Love it. And we will come back and unpack more about that journey in a moment, but Kevin would love to hear from you. Sure. Over the past 20 plus years, I've been in the investment world, started my career in equity capital markets as an equity research analyst covering software companies um, in San Francisco during the dot-com. So I've seen a lot in my career starting with with that time period. And in 2009, after having worked in a single family office managing capital, I took a pivot and jumped over to JP Morgan Private Bank Wealth Management, really wanted to leverage my ability to build relationships with public and private companies, CEOs, CFOs, industry sponsors such as private equity and venture capital partners. And so that was how I got into the wealth management side of the investment world. Fast forward to today, similar to Sarah, I spent a dozen years at JP Morgan Private Bank working primarily with technology entrepreneurs, given my background, I'm having worked in San Francisco in that business. And as we thought about where the path might lead post JP Morgan, it was really an entrepreneurial mindset that I had. Um, I couldn't help but have some of that DNA of my clients and their entrepreneurial journeys bleed into my own DNA. And so looking at the independent path was really a, a natural fit for me. Mm. And tell us just quickly a little bit about how you and your other partners came together. What was the genesis of that? So I would say the partnership that we formed was really rooted in soul searching in terms of what we wanted our futures to look like as we kind of took this next step in serving as advisors to families and individuals that were creating a lot of wealth. And when Kevin and our partners would get together, we always said the same thing. We want to have the opportunity to have control, to meet clients where they are, and to be able to serve them in the way that they need to be served in order to achieve success in their financial life. An important component of that was trust and partnership. It was putting family first, actually, and making sure that we all were entering into a partnership that we knew that we could trust each other and also have the ability to still take good care of our families. And we decided together that what the pieces that we liked at J.P. Morgan, we could find elsewhere in a smaller firm because we had spent time at J.P. Morgan, you know, earlier on in our careers, understanding what it was like to serve a client, not only on the investment side, but on the wealth and estate planning side, on the financial planning side. So our goal was really to get together with the five of us and determine a firm that would allow us to serve clients in that way across all aspects of their financial life. So we embarked on a journey exploring a lot of different options across the major money center, wirehouses, as well as small local RIA shops and everything in between. Kevin, so let me ask you then, share with us a little bit about the business you built. How much were you managing in assets when you left J.P. Morgan? Who were the clients? What did the business look like, just for perspective? 
Sure, absolutely. We were managing several billion dollars you know, on behalf of clients. As I think about the demographics of our clients, it was really entrepreneurs, both first time and serial in nature, as well as generational wealth. And that was spread across geographies. So I was focused mainly here in Colorado um, and then the innovation economies in Colorado. Sarah had built a terrific business in Utah uh, and then helped open that for JP Morgan Private Bank. So we really straddled across multiple lines of business, you know, and would not count a single one as uh, as being um you know uh you know where we where we did our business. Mm-hmm. So I would say I, I I enjoy and have a tendency to to work with families that have generational wealth. Many of them are already in their second or third generation. And I've spent a lot of my career starting back in New York, spending time with these these generations that are really focused on how to be a good steward of capital and pass on money to heirs and philanthropic endeavors. And then, like Kevin said, there's also a big portion of business that's really focused on entrepreneurs that are new in their wealth creation journey, but will have generational wealth. And what does that mean for them and helping them frame out what their goals and missions are for their family. Mm. In terms of the type of work that we do for them, it really spans their entire financial well-being. So we always start with a plan and we try to work and get very close to families and understand what's important to them. What are their priorities? How do they want their money to work for them? And what are their spending goals and needs? From that planning exercise, then we help them frame up how we think about investing the money. How do we make sure that the money is achieving their goals as it relates to their financial goals and put them in a position where they can really sleep at night when they have a financial plan and investment plan in place? You can't do any of that without estate planning. So estate planning is really fundamental to making sure that you understand the buckets of capital and their time horizon and the purpose that they're going to serve. So we spend a lot of time on estate planning with our clients. And then finally, it gets to kind of the brass tacks of putting this plan in place. So the due diligence, the manager selection, the asset allocation, and then the ongoing monitoring and tactical trading, depending on what's going on in the market. Complementing that, we spend a lot of time making sure that we're getting the reporting right, that we're looking at their total financial picture, their total balance sheet, and not just thinking about the asset side of the balance sheet, the liability side as well, and making sure that we're using their balance sheet most efficiently. And then finally, we like to think about making sure at the end of the day that we're giving these families back time to spend it wherever they want to beyond just their day-to-day financial health. So starting another business, vacationing with family, and in order to give back time, we complement a lot of what we do on the investment, the financial planning, the estate planning side, the tax piece with lifestyle services and helping them kind of serve as a concierge mm-hmm. into anything else that they might need to help support their family on a go forward basis. Yeah. So I want to, so much you said, and I want to unpack more of that, but Sarah, let me back up for one second. So you joined Crescent. And I want to understand a little bit, we were lucky enough to interview Avi Stein last year or the year before for this podcast, and he shared with us the Crescent value proposition, but would love to hear from your perspective as an advisor, what do you think the firm's value proposition is? Who is Crescent Capital? So I'll say a couple of things, and no one will say it as eloquently as Avi will, that's for sure. But we are one of the largest multifamily offices out there, and we have the ability to have this institutional scale, which gives us a great amount of access for our clients, while still remaining very boutique-like and nimble. What's different here is every single client matters, and that comes through in a couple ways. So first of all, we are owned 70% by employees and 30% by clients, so we all have skin in the game. We're all marching towards the same goal to grow, grow smartly and to take good care of our clients and make sure clients are happy. We really have the opportunity here to meet clients where they are. So we often get the question, what's your minimum? And I wouldn't put our business in a place of what's the minimum client that we serve. It's rather what's the complexity of the balance sheet and what does that client need? So we really have the opportunity to meet clients where they are and their wealth creation or wealth preservation. We do that by flexing on fees by flexing on services that we provide 
and also being able to do that without conflict or being beholden to a quarterly earnings report, so to speak. We also are focused on democratizing the family office experience. So we are close to $30 billion now, and we want each and every one of our clients to feel like they're investing like a $30 billion client. So in addition to all the services that we provide and that I've mentioned you know, in, in our previous comments, we also create wonderful access to private investments in a unique way, in a preferred way. So we focus on preferred economics. And really look for opportunities that you're not going to get with the broader, larger private investment firms. So all that to say, when you boil it down, we like to focus on very deep planning with our families and understanding financial needs. We like to focus on inexpensive beta or broad market opportunities within a portfolio and focus our efforts on creating alpha in the private market while complementing that with all the other family office services that we offer at Crescent. Yeah, I love that. And I think the operative word you use, flexing on pricing, flexing on access, flexibility is, I think, the theme of a lot of this, and we'll come back to it. But Kevin, I want to pivot to you for a second. We'll come back to Crescent in a bit, but I want to focus for a moment on your time at J.P. Morgan Private Bank. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience as private bankers there? Absolutely. It was a terrific time there. I, I would not give any of my 12 years away. So first and foremost, you know, we had the opportunity to build relationships with really terrific clients. Again, most of mine were first generation entrepreneurs in the innovation space. And so there was really a great opportunity to add value because for the most part, these entrepreneurs were heads down building their business and trying to grow that. Maybe they had a family alongside that they didn't have as much bandwidth to, to share with them as they, they would have liked. And so we were able to come in with our variety of resources and help them on a lot of different levels. Some of that may have been investment related. Some of that may have been estate planning. And some of it was balance sheet management, both you know the right and the left side of their balance sheet. So it was a very fun environment, but as Sarah indicated in some of her comments earlier, we started to see the direction of that change over time. And really for me, losing a couple of deals to multifamily offices several years ago gave me an indication that the puck was going somewhere else and that we weren't necessarily skating to to where the puck was headed, to borrow from Wayne Gretzky yeah, um, and, yeah. and, his fam- and his famous saying. Yeah. So let me just ask you a follow-up question of that. You said the direction of that, and I think you were referring to the fact that it was a fun, wonderful place to work. The direction of that was changing over time. What do you mean by that specifically? No, I think, uh, and, and Sarah touched on it earlier, there will always be a place for J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley in the wealth management world. But I think it's a different dynamic when you have to report earnings on a quarterly basis. And when you are an extremely um, over-regulated, too big to fail financial institution, it just creates a different dynamic. Um, you know, Remember, I grew up in equity capital markets and I was on earnings calls every quarter for the companies that I, that I covered. And so with that comes artificial constraints or, or pressures For instance, there'll be times when you can grow and when you can't grow. There'll be times when the focus of management is on margins versus growth. And so those create very unique dynamics that as employees who are inside of the business have to manage and and navigate around. And I think Sarah and I and many of our colleagues did everything we could to sometimes shield our clients from the sausage making that was going on in these big firms. And I think we were largely successful. Unfortunately, there were times when we couldn't shield our clients from that sausage making and they got a glimpse behind the curtain. And it is what it is. I put it in that bucket, Mindy. That's just the dynamic of those big firms. Yeah. And you know, it's so interesting, Kevin, you say that because I've done now probably hundreds of these interviews, whether it be advisors from the likes of the wirehouses like Morgan Merrill, UBS, other private bankers, every institution. And essentially they all say the same thing. I loved my early years. I'm grateful for the time I spent at fill in the blank institution and wouldn't have traded it. It helped me to build a great business. It was great. But 
I began to feel it change over time. And I liked what you said about the overregulated, too big to fail institution you worked for and having to sort of bend or yield or run the business according to a lot of artificial constraints. So that makes sense. And I've heard that many times before. Let me ask you a follow-up question to that, Kevin. Private banking is all about working in a team construct. The notion that there are many constituencies that may touch the same client. And in part, that's by design because the bank doesn't want the assets to be portable. They want them to remain sticky to the bank. And the more people that touch them at the bank, the less likely they are to be portable. So from your perspective as an advisor or private banker, what was it like to work in a team construct and how much control did that yield you as the individual advisor or one member of the team over clients? I personally enjoyed working in the team construct. And it was very important that if we were going to leave, JP Morgan has indicated that we find a platform where we can operate as a team in the best interests of our clients and really make sure that we are attacking all of the strategic chunky pieces of their financial lives, whether it be investment related or otherwise. I hear where you're coming from in terms of the design, the private banking platform and having that team construct. I think it bifurcates along a couple of lines. If it's a referral from a commercial bank and we've got this client who's going through a liquidity event or or needs some help on the personal side, I think that falls squarely into into one bucket versus if you're out there organically building relationships, organically networking, a ground game, so to speak, building those relationships. I think those relationships are more, I'm trying not to use the word portable. Those are more genuine and authentic and it's not transactional in nature. Let's let's put it that way. What about whether it be an organically developed relationship that you sourced or a referral from the bank. What about the fact that in a private banking construct, you've got sort of the relationship management person, you've got the investment person, and you've got others that play different roles on the team. But in most cases, at least with most of the teams I've worked with, they do separate things. So it makes the client less beholden to one particular advisor. I think if you allow yourself to be siloed, then 100%. But the way I would interact with clients was well beyond relationship manager. I actually loathe the term relationship manager because it is, to your point, very limiting. So if it was the investment portfolio, I just happen to come out of an institutional investment background. So I would be very front and center in working with the investment specialist to say, Is that in the best interest of the Mm. client? Should we be thinking about it that way? Oh, by the way, I'm going to put myself in the client's shoes. Are those returns as good as New York is saying they are? No, they're not. And here's why. So I think it's dependent upon the advisor and what role they want to play in that relationship that gets to the robustness of that relationship. Mm. Interesting. If you don't mind, I might might add something there. Please. I think that's part of the reason that Kevin and I chose each other as partners as we chose the other partners in our group here is because we knew that we were all fully committed and engaged with all the relationships that we had the privilege of covering and working on and, and managing over the course of our career at JP Morgan. None of us here today on our team are only solely focused on one aspect of the business. And in fact, we love the team approach. We think it's really important for a client to always have somebody pick up the phone and have some familiarity with their situation and what may be going on in their life. So regardless of vacations, illnesses, anything else that may get in the way of any one of our partners at any point in time, there's always someone here that knows their situation and how to be helpful to them. So in some ways, we've kind of carried on that team aspect from J.P. Morgan, from a private banking lens, over to to Crescent as an independent advisor. And we very much still believe in a team approach. It's just that we all are much more engaged and focused kind of across the entire relationship rather than 
just being the administrative relationship manager. So. Yeah, well, it sounds like from what you're both telling me is you figured out a way to make it work within the walls of JP Morgan, but you took what you liked of it, which was the notion of a team construct that worked for you to the benefit of your clients and bettered it with greater flexibility at Crescent. Is that a good way to say it? Yeah, I think it is, Mindy. Good. So Sarah, back to your life at JP Morgan, what kind of or how often did you get referrals from the bank? It's interesting because A lot of the referrals that came from the bank actually came from cultivating your own relationships with other lines of business. So certainly there were situations where using JP Morgan terms, the market manager had the opportunity to refer business into one of the bankers and would select the best banker equipped to win the business. But a lot of the referrals that came from the bank actually came from cultivating your own relationships within retail, within the commercial bank, with the investment bank, maybe. So the skill set of building those relationships, really treating those people as centers of influence in your circle and creating partnerships that they trust you and want to refer you business is how those referrals came through the bank. It was less so this kind of allocation of inbound calls on a very regular basis. So while they were many of them bank generated, it was really from cultivating your own relationships across lines of business. Kevin, the compensation at J.P. Morgan, and as with most private banks, was salary bonus. What did you think of that construct versus a commission-based construct? Obviously, never having done wealth management prior to J.P. Morgan, it was the only thing that I knew. And certainly, as I familiarized myself with wealth management, knowing you know the compensation structures at other platforms, you know, I think that a salary bonus can be really effective when everything is firing on all cylinders, not only across your own business, but across the group that you work in or your market, plus the private bank and the firm overall. I've been on Wall Street long enough to know that rarely do those stars all align at once. So when those stars don't you know, align or a couple of them are off kilter, it can be a frustrating, opaque sort of compensation structure. So while money wasn't the number one reason why we elected to leave JP Morgan, I think having greater clarity on if we do well for clients, if we build a growing business, having more clarity on what we bring to the firm and the value that we create, I think there's a lot of merit in that. Yeah, I think a lot of private bankers we talk to talk about the limiting nature of salary bonus. When you're young in the business and growing, the guaranteed nature can be appealing. And as you say, when you're hitting on all cylinders, when the stores are aligned between your initiatives and the bank's initiatives, it can be very appealing. But over time, as you build a a several billion dollar book, it can be limiting. And I imagine that that began to be part of what was going on when you decided to leave as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Kevin, with that in mind, what was going on at J.P. Morgan in the year or so before you left? Like, what changed? I mean, you talked about you were losing deals over time to the multifamily office space. What changed? and What made you lose some of those deals from your perspective? That's a good question. I'm not sure whether I can point to, to any one thing. I think that, you know, now being on this side of the aisle in the multifamily office space and talking to people outside of wealth management that have referred us deals since we've been at Crescent, I think there was definitely a very real or perceived view of conflicts being at a bank relative to an independent investment advisor. People may not have come right out overtly and communicated that to you, but now in speaking with folks that are referring us deals and saying like, gosh, I didn't get a referral from you for the last eight to 10 years. And I know you've been super busy transacting with your clients. They have acknowledged that those real or perceived conflicts were part of their thinking. So that's been really interesting to get a glimpse into now that we've been at Crescent. But I think also with any big organization, I'm not here to slam JP Morgan at all, but I think there were certain tensions between growth 
and profitability that Sarah and I and our team had to manage through that caused us to consider, is there a better model? Is there a mm -hmm. different platform where we can have greater control, to borrow from Sarah, greater control in how we manage cl client relationships, how we staff client relationships. And I think that was a big key to our decision making. So it sounds like it was less about running away from JP Morgan and more about having greater clarity about what you wanted, how best to um, serve clients. And you began to see it probably better for yourselves elsewhere than staying status quo. So Sarah, let me pivot to you for a second. So once you decided that perhaps there were greener pastures outside of JP Morgan, and what options did you consider? Like you liked the multifamily office space, but did you consider building your own independent firm? Certainly did. We kind of ran this almost like an M&A process in that we wanted to go out and make sure whomever we decided to partner with, that we were bringing value to them and that they were bringing value to us and giving us a platform that we'd be able to really serve our clients in the way that we wanted to. I would say starting your own was a path that I explored several years ago. And there are the dynasties of the world that will help you give you your own platform and kind of really give you the backbones and the infrastructure to do it. But it's a heavy lift and it's complex and there's a lot that goes along with it. So we took that path off of the table pretty quickly what we did learn at JP Morgan is creating a brand does matter. And we were watching what Crescent was doing over the past four years and watching the brand and kind of establishing who they wanted to be in the market. And it was pretty impressive. So that box was checked in terms of, you know, finding a brand that we felt like we could align with. Once we had taken that build your own off the table pretty quickly, we did Crescent kind of sat head and shoulders above the rest, but we did explore some other options that were similar in nature, not the same, but similar in nature. But what we found pretty quickly too, is that many of these firms were focused on kind of the growth, roll up, gather assets phase of their business model, and maybe a little bit less about the let's build a long-term sustainable company that's here to make sure we're putting the client first. We also could not move forward without at least understanding what the wirehouses had to offer, but we knew pretty quickly that that avenue was more of a portability exercise combined with potentially a large compensation up front, and we had all agreed that that was not on our priority list whatsoever. We really wanted to find a place that had a differentiated model, a differentiated message, a differentiated brand. And really, Crescent was the only place that fit that bill. Yeah. Thank you for that, Sarah. So, Kevin, as with every private banker, we know that if, you know, if it were a perfect world, everybody might move to Crescent or a model like Crescent. But there is a pretty onerous employment agreement that private bankers had and you had that includes a garden leaf. How do you reconcile that? How scary was it to not be able to talk with your clients for 60 or 90 days? Honestly, it wasn't scary at all. Personally, I knew that the decision I was making was a 10, 12, 15 year decision that I was making. And it was not going to be governed by what could or could not happen over the next 60 or 90 days via a garden leap. And absolutely going from the known to the unknown, there is fear around that if you let it reside. But quite frankly, I had a lot of people reach out to me once word got out that I had resigned from JP Morgan and was going somewhere else. And so that was colleagues at JP Morgan that were people in the community and certainly clients when they got wind, they certainly reached out as well. And how many client relationships did you have when you left JP Morgan? I had about 55, 55 to 60. And does that, Sarah, is, did you have an additional on top of that or 55 in total? I had an additional 60 on top of that. And I mentioned earlier generational wealth. So 60, if you compound that with uh, the multiple generations, probably turned into something like 120 individual clients when it came down to it. So despite Garden Leaf or including Garden Leaf, how about client portability concerns? I mean, typically clients of private bankers 
may not be as portable or some of them may not be as portable because the clients are more tied to the bank. Was that true in your case? It was something that the team gave a lot of thought and we talked a lot about, Mindy. As Sarah indicated, certainly we evaluated the other private banking platforms and and wirehouses. When you're gauging that potential avenue, it is a portability exercise, right? It's what, how many clients do you have? What are the assets and loans and deposits? What proportion do you think can come over or not? And what's the time frame for looking at that? So that would have been a very, I think that would have been the safe route for our team to go. It would have been the easy answer. It's a well-worn path from JP Morgan private bank to some of these other firms, but we thought that was the easy answer. Instead, what we really focused on is how do we build the best business over a 10, 12, 15 year time frame. And we really had to look ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what? This thesis is not contingent upon clients moving from JP Morgan. If they come out of their own volition because they're attracted to the Crescent platform and they find value in the service levels that we bring to the relationships, then terrific. We will entertain those conversations in due course. But we're very, very adamant that the thesis should be, we will be successful as a team with zero clients porting over from JP Morgan. I love that. And I think you bring up a great point. We talk with advisors considering change all the time about being comfortable with the notion of shrink to grow, that it is unlikely and unrealistic that 100% of your clients will move. And even if you're lucky enough to have every one of them move, you need to be prepared for the fact that they may not. You took that 10 steps further and said, even if zero clients follow, we are comfortable enough with who we are and what we're going to build or where we're going and who we're partnering with, that even if zero come, we are confident that we're doing the right thing and we will build it again over time. Is that right? I think you've got, like any good entrepreneur, you're betting on yourself, 100%. Yeah. So here you are a year later. Was it a good bet? Are you glad you did it? I am incredibly excited that we that we made the move, Mindy. The platform here at Crescent has been everything that we thought it would be. The level of executive engagement from Abby Stein and the other co-founders um, has been exactly as it was positioned to us. So it's been a lot of fun. When you're building something, it's never going to be easy. So you know, I'm not going to lie to you and say, hey, it's just been smooth and up and to the right. But the Crescent message has resonated with folks that we've been dialoguing with, and that's with organic new folks that we're meeting in the community, as well as former former clients. You bring up a good point. We know that historically, private bankers have big books of business. Most of them manage billion or more multi-billion dollar books, but it definitely takes longer to move them. So even with only a year's time where I'm assuming you haven't moved 100% of your business, you still feel it's a good move because the eye is on the future. And not everybody would feel that way. That's true. And the goal of the exercise is not 100% of our former clients, because quite frankly, plenty of them are not going to be a fit for this platform. And that's okay. We knew that going into it. But for those folks who've inquired and wanted to learn more, the dialogue has been extremely solid. Yeah. So how many years do you imagine just wild guess. How long do you think it will take you to be back to that several billion in assets? Finger in the air? Mm -hmm. Somewhere between two to five years. Got it. That's very helpful. So Sarah, I want to ask you about Crescent. You already talked about the why Crescent, but I want to revisit something that Avi and his co-founder, Eric Becker, had told me when they first launched the firm. They said that as ultra high net worth clients themselves, they couldn't find a firm or an advisor that would do for them from a financial perspective what they needed. So they actually set out to build it. So were they right from your perspective that a model like Crescent didn't exist elsewhere? Absolutely. And I think now being a year in, I can say that pretty firmly as we have come up against our competition and some opportunities, we've heard of maybe the Iconics or a few other independent firms that we've been compared to. 
but none of these firms actually have the depth of talent and services that we offer internally. So as far as we can tell, there really isn't anyone else like us on the street right now. Mm -hmm. And what is it about the model? So Crescent or otherwise, what is it about this multifamily office model that Crescent is built upon that resonates with ultra high net worth clients? I think that the conversation starts again with the plan and priorities of a family and not just with how are we going to invest your portfolio. The families that want to work with us understand that in order to achieve financial success, whatever that means to each individual family, it's broader than just making sure that you have an asset allocation and a portfolio that works for you. You really are only going to achieve that success if you have the expertise to understand, again, going back to kind of some of the core tenants of the estate plan, the financial plan, the tax piece. The tax piece is critical. We came from, as Kevin mentioned earlier, a severely regulated bank. And while we had an eye toward taxes, we actually could not formally give tax advice. So therefore, we didn't have the ability to be as strategic as we can be here when we are thinking about mitigating taxes for a family that's going through a transaction or thinking about how to gift in an efficient managed way or thinking about how to tax loss harvest. And here we can actually do that because not only do we do tax compliance, but we have CPAs as a part of our team and we can think about tax strategy. So so I just think that the depth and the scope of the advice that we can provide really spans beyond just making sure the investment portfolio is right. And when you can coordinate all of those pieces, your likelihood of a better outcome for the family, I believe, is much higher. Mm. So one of you mentioned lifestyle services, concierge services. Give us an example of what that offering looks like. And did you have something comparable to offer clients at JP Morgan? No, we did not. And in fact, when we first joined Crescent, we weren't even sure how that would integrate into the conversation because most of the families I had worked with historically had their own services that they relied on for things that you consider concierge. But what we now understand being here for a year is that concierge, sure, it can mean helping a family plan a special vacation, a safari, or coordinating family members around the world to gather somewhere for a special occasion. But it's actually much deeper than that. It goes beyond just the fun stuff. You may have ill parents and you want help aging and helping them age in place. And so, you know, connecting with and leveraging services in the medical field to make sure that your family is being really well taken care of. You may have some cyber issues going on at your home office, and you really want to make sure that you and your family are protected correctly from technology and cyber standpoint. So we work with partners to make sure that you're protected in, in cyberspace, which is a really critical point, as we all know, in this day and age. Or it may be as simple as we're doing a trip to New York City and we don't have a nanny for the kids. Can you help us find that? Or we need reservations at a fun restaurant for dad's birthday. So the concierge level of service, again, really spans beyond just the fun stuff. And it goes back to the notion that we always want to be your first call. And sometimes that first call isn't about your portfolio or your taxes or your estate plan. Sometimes it's something very personal. And, and if we can be the first call for a family as it relates to something beyond just their financial life, then we leverage our concierge services to help that family achieve whatever they're looking to achieve. I understand the value of wanting to be a client's first call, essentially being one-stop shopping or being everything to them. But how do you make sure that you are well compensated for the time you spent planning a vacation or helping them find a nanny in New York or dealing with cybersecurity or the like? That's a really great question. Um, so our fees when we are engaging with a family on full family office engagement are certainly encompassing of all of the, the things that we try to take on for families beyond just managing the portfolio. So our, our fee schedule lends itself to really attempting and, and hoping to be the first call for a family. Um, and then there are certainly scenarios where there are maybe some ad hoc or services that weren't in scope with a family at the onset of the relationship. But as we pivot and grow with families, we try to do that with our services too. And so 
periodically, we make sure that the engagement makes sense for the family and makes sense for Crescent so we can continue to give them that high level of service. At the end of the day, we want to be fair and we want to make sure that we are serving the family at the level at which they're, they're paying us for and we want to make sure we're getting paid for all the services that we're providing the family. ask you something. So look, opting for Cresset was definitely not the path of least resistance. It was an unfamiliar name to clients and prospects, unfamiliar to you, I would imagine as well, a relatively new entity and a transition package that it certainly included some cash, but a lot of equity and something many advisors would consider nothing more than a lottery ticket. So wondering how you reconciled that part or how you thought about that part. Sure. As I mentioned earlier, it was not the the easiest path for our team to take. So we had to have the right mindset that, A, we wanted to be entrepreneurial in nature, truly entrepreneurial in shrinking to grow, to borrow from from something you said, but also uh, an acknowledgement that the wealth management world is undergoing a shift. And it's a shift away from the traditional platforms. Sometimes I equate it to the microbrewing industry in this country, Mindy, right? There'll always be people that will drink Miller and Budweiser and Coors, you know, the big mega breweries. But that's not the kinds of clients that we want to engage with. You know, they're operating. They want best of breed. They want differentiated. They want bespoke. And that's going to lie in a platform like Cressets, you know, a multi-family office platform that's going to be flexible to their unique circumstances. So taking that piece and then saying, okay, what's the culture of the place we're, we're thinking about? And I remember going down to Jupiter, Florida to meet Abby Stein and Eric Becker and Jack Ablin and the co-founders of Cresset and reflecting that these guys genuinely enjoy each other, right? Their wives enjoy each other. They are happy to give each other grief if somebody says something, Mm -hmm. you know, wrong. So that was one component. And then knowing their backgrounds, knowing their experience, how they conducted themselves, I came back to the team and said, we really need to seriously consider Crescent because personally and professionally, I can learn from each and every one of them. And unfortunately, I wasn't going to be able to to say that where we were residing prior. Yeah. So you you developed a trust and a faith in them, the belief that rather than owning, if you had gone fully independent and build your own and owned 100% of your equity, that owning a piece of equity in Crescent, what's now a $30 billion entity, was going to be worth more to you than the 100% equity in something you built yourself. It's a little bit of the buy versus build. Yeah. Companies across all kinds of industries encounter this decision point. And yes, we could have built it from the ground up and leveraged platforms and over time built our own brand. And yes, we would have had 100% of that equity. And that has a different risk perspective than joining a firm, albeit a growth firm that at the time was three and a half years old when we joined. And so we're now four and a half years old. And joining a firm that is building it um, on the fly, has a terrific brand, and has solved a number of the issues that we would have had to uh, encounter from ground zero. So it's not a perfect algorithm to make that decision, but it was one across multiple dimensions that we evaluated. And for our team, you know, who wanted to be makers, who wanted to be entrepreneurs and build something lasting. We essentially viewed it as we were a platform for growth for Crescent of itself was a growth platform. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that shares some perspective there. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. Sarah, how about Crescent's technology? How does it compare to what you had at JP Morgan? Well, we have Salesforce. That is a huge upgrade. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. I could stop full stop there and be excited about that piece to help us manage our business more efficiently. What I will say about Crescent and what's exciting is there's current state, but future state is the focus. So we are investing in trialing, beta testing, 
so many different types of technology to make sure that not only the advisor experience is best in class and efficient and helps us do our, our jobs better, but also making sure that the client experience and how we interface with them from a technological standpoint is constantly evolving. And I think at one point, I don't know if Avi would want me to say this, but I think at one point he told his CTO, our CTO, that he would like us to consider digital dominance in the wealth management space. Mm. So, so there is a lot of focus on what we have now as kind of the basics to help us manage our business and manage portfolios but really making sure that we're constantly innovating and finding the right partners and or building or, or amending what we have internally to make sure that both advisors and clients have a wonderful experience. And in fact, I was back in Chicago. We do a lot of kind of think tank type offsites where we get a few folks together across the business to kind of reimagine how we can make different parts of the business better. And in the time that I spent in Chicago, we were really focused on the onboarding process. And when we sat there and thought about how could we make the onboarding process faster, more efficient, more transparent, nothing was off the table. And in fact, it's kind of fun. We go through this process together and coming up with, with ways that we want to you know, improve the onboarding process in this particular instance. And we present it directly to Appy, one of the co-founders, which is, you know, not something I've done in my previous life. And we get feedback from him and he pushes us and we push him and to come up with a solution. And then next thing you know, that's sitting with our technology team to help us make sure that we can implement on the ideas that, that we've come up with and creating a better, more efficient, more transparent experience for the advisor and the client. So what I'll say is technology is great today and we can do our jobs really well with what we have, but more importantly, we're really focused on what the future state is and making sure that we're constantly evolving and innovating to make it a good experience for advisors and clients alike. Good stuff for sure. Kevin, Crescent just merged with Mary's from Family Wealth. Tell us about that. Like, what do you expect that merger to bring to the table? Yes. So we, we did just announce a merger with Maristem. And really, as you think about acquisitions at Crescent here, fortunately, the lion's share of our growth to you know nearly 30 billion of AUM, as you noted, Mindy, has been organic. But when we do do acquisitions, um, like Maristam or Berman before that, it's really for strategic reasons. It could be that you know investment acumen, the terrific reputation of the firm and the people. And in Maristam's case, it certainly checked the boxes on, on those. But also the Twin Cities is a market that we deem as, as very strategic for the firm. And it also has terrific beachheads in other markets such as Naples and Scottsdale, where we think there's terrific growth opportunities for this business. Mm. Yeah, I like the idea of the notion that it was strategic. A couple other questions for you. So, Sarah, in transitioning from J.P. Morgan to Crescent, what was it like? Was it daunting? And who primarily helped you to manage through it? Great question. So it was daunting before it happened. Uh, that garden leave certainly leaves you kind of wanting more in terms of what your first day looks like. But what was impressive is that Crescent had already spent a lot of time transitioning teams from various firms. And so there was one woman in particular that really has led and continues to lead that effort for Crescent. And she, from the moment we resigned from JP Morgan till the day we officially started in our seat, she helped kind of run a program that she would deem the term, as she called it, preparing to compete. So what we had the opportunity to do is sit with many of the leaders across the business here, uh, further understand what Crescent is about, understand the operational and technological positions that we would be in when, when we arrived on the scene and officially had a Crescent email address. And so she really was our, our shepherd, so to speak, through the process, both during garden leave and then on our first day. And when we started, the outreach from everybody here, not just the woman leading kind of the integration piece, was remarkable. It was staggering, actually, how many people reached out to say, hey, I'm here to help. I've done this recently. Call if you need anything. And so we very quickly made a lot of friends across the firm 
that in addition to kind of our, our integration partner, we had a lot of people that were supportive in helping us figure out how to get things done, where to go, how to use the technology, what we could and couldn't do. So it was a really, as I think as seamless as it could be, a really seamless transition from the respect of just getting up and running at a new firm after multiple decades in a larger bank. Good. So Kevin, so let me ask you, given all of this, what percentage of your multi-billion dollar JP Morgan book were you able to recreate in the nine to 12 months or so you've been up and running with Crescent? Yeah, so we're, we're having a lot of terrific conversations and the story is really resonating, especially with entrepreneurs. And so we're very fortunate that in the first nine to 12 months, we've been able to recreate essentially a quarter of our book. Yeah. I love that you said that. Thank you. There are many listeners on this call that would say, how is that a success? To only move 25% doesn't sound all that successful. To my ears, I hear it differently. Your metric, your goal was very different. You were unique in saying we would have been okay with zero because we believe so much in what we were going to be able to build and do that our metric for success was different. And so 25% to us seems like a win. And if on top of that, you take into account all of the amazing conversations and likelihood for success we will have in the future, to us, it was a huge success. Is that, does that sound right? Yeah, that's absolutely fair. And when you take into consideration that some of that success has been in direct competition versus our prior firm, I think that's an important attribute. Yeah. And I appreciate the answer also because the goal of this podcast is not to sell advisors on making a move and to paint a rosy picture that, you know, it's all it's all perfect and up and to the right, as you said, Kevin. It's not. And expectations need to be managed. And so your realistic assessment of what it's like is really very, very helpful. I appreciate that. So I want to hear from both of you. What's next for you both? And where do you see the business? going. Why don't we start with you, Kevin, with that, and then I'll turn to you, Sarah. How do you think you'll continue to grow it? Yeah, the team has been here almost a year. So as I think about it, mapping out the runway for our growth, we're just concluding the initial stage of growth. We've gotten our feet under us. We know Cressid. We understand what resonates, what the value proposition is. And as we've discussed, having a lot of terrific conversations, and we've had a lot of early success. So now it's what's the next stage of growth look like, right? Who are the potential clients, the potential families that we want to have on our highly curated roster of clients? And some of those are very well known. We've had conversations with them. Maybe they've even given us a silent verbal commitment to work with us once they have a little bit of bandwidth to focus on that transition. And we've done this in partnership with Avi and Eric and the team here at Crescent. We are very transparent with them about what we have going on, where we might need their help, where the opportunities are. So that's the next stage that we're embarking and mapping out as a team. If the goal is to double from here in the next 12 months, for instance, Mm. what are the processes and the steps that we have to put in place right here, right now, so that when we wake up 12 months from now, then we we will have achieved that success. So really, it's, it's really focusing on the process and being deliberate with those conversations that we're having out in the ecosystem. Yeah, well, sounds great. Sarah, anything you'd add to that in terms of how you'll continue to grow it? Yeah, the only thing I would say is it was a real surprise to me after joining Crescent, how many individuals and families actually preclude a bank from their search when they're looking from a wealth advisor from the very beginning. Kevin alluded to this earlier, receiving referrals from attorneys in town that we had never received referrals from before. Really places in our ecosystem where we've always had friendly dialogue but never really done business together it's opened up a whole new avenue of potential business for us and really understanding those types of avenues so that we can capitalize on them further. So I think that's one thing that was a big surprise for me. And it opens up a lot of opportunity for us to 
to consider other places to uncover um, new relationships and new opportunities. Mm. The sec- second thing I would say is we don't have to start at zero every year. We're not on the clock to create a revenue growth by metrics deemed by someone higher up by us. We're here to take really good care of our existing clients and grow a little bit every year. So what will be really interesting over the next couple of years as we're growing this business is finding our sweet spot with how many clients we can cover effectively and efficiently and always focus on growing the business, but making sure that we're really focused on taking really good care of our existing clients. And what I've found over the course of my career is when you do a really good job with your existing clients, that usually manifests itself in referrals too. So I think the new avenues of families that maybe are precluding banks from their search combined with doing a good job for existing clients and creating referrals out of those relationships are going to be two really important key components in growing the business here that maybe weren't so um, at our previous employer. You know, I love that answer because I would say the same thing. I think for me, if you are laser focused and really deeply rooted in your vision and being authentic and always doing the right thing by clients and guiding people the way they want to be guided without concern for your own personal financial gain, really focusing on the right things as you are, then the money follows, the referrals follow, the clients follow, the growth follows. That has absolutely been my mantra for the past 25 years. So I live it and breathe it, and and I love that you do too. Well, I've taken up a ton of your time. One parting question that I ask every guest, so I'll ask both of you very quickly in a minute or less. So any parting words of advice for your ex-colleagues in still in the private banking world? So whether that be current private bankers at JP Morgan or private bankers from any private bank, if one of them called you today and asked if making a move was worthwhile, in spite of the fact that only 25% of the assets have moved in the past year or so, what would you tell them? If someone called me, Mindy, and said, hey, what does it look like on the other side? I would say you can be a success anywhere. If you really, truly have that confidence in yourself, you know how to take care of clients, right? It's not dependent upon the business card that you own. We found that in a very short period of time here at Crescent. And if you're genuine, if you're authentic with your clients, if you always have their best interests at heart first and foremost, then you can find success anywhere. And oh, by the way, there's a lot of different models out there. We certainly learned that during our process in evaluation, and you can find a platform where you can be successful on your own. Great. Sarah and Kevin, I can't thank you enough. This was delightful. Your passion and enthusiasm for the work that you do, for your choice of Crescent as partner, for the future of the business, how you think about your clients, everything about it is contagious and wonderful. And I'm really grateful for your time and your wisdom. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, Mindy. Appreciate it. Thank you. No doubt, Kevin, Sarah, and their team built a strong business at J.P. Morgan. But like so many other advisors, there came a point where they wanted to do more for their high net worth clients. For them, Crescent was the answer. But I think it was their closing advice that leaves the best message of all. If you have confidence in yourself and the ability to take care of clients, you can find success anywhere. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the articles link to browse recent topics. These written pieces are an ideal way of staying informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. You can feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached at 973-476-8578, which is my cell, or by email mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. 
And keep in mind that our services are available without cost to the advisor. You can see our website for more information. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. If you're listening on the Apple Podcasts app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a store rating and a review. It will let other advisors know it's a show worth their time to listen to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence. Independence.